It's a special talk in science today with my co-host, Dr. Brad Tucker, who's on the road for work. Brad, humanity has the first image of a black hole. Yeah, like an actual image. You know, it's one of these things that uh, people thought were not really possible. Uh, the Event Horizon Telescope has been a huge project to get here. Uh, and it's amazing to see like a black hole and it actually looks like a, a black hole like exactly how we describe it. Now, we were talking on Tuesday uh, about the possibilities with this photo. Uh, If it wasn't a circle, theories of relativity would be flung out the window. Have we had to redefine science? No, it's it's come out perfectly spherical or circular as as much as we can measure. Um, It looks pretty cool because, in fact, if you you take the theoretical model of what should have have been seen, and then you kind of degrade the quality a bit to match the telescope resolution, you get exactly what we see, even to the point where around the black hole, it's a bit clumpy, uh, and that, uh, you know, it's not a perfectly even like a donut, it's kind of like a donut that someone bit into it or nibbled on, and that's because we know that gas swirls around a black hole, and it kind of swirls around like in a spinning disc, like a top. And that's what we see. So, in fact, relativity doesn't need to be fixed. It's another tick in the box for yet another right Einstein. It's incredible to think that a man all those decades ago uh, came up with all these ideas and we're proving him right. Yeah, and, and in all sorts of different ways. You know, I mean, our knowledge of relativity and black holes has changed hugely in the past few years from having the discovery of black holes merging and producing gravitational waves to now this. It's it's now getting really cool evidence and really cool stuff behind it. It's a really, it's amazing, I think, uh, just flat out. And the incredible thing that I learned about this uh, was that there's five petabytes of data that were collected uh, even a couple of years ago, uh, and it's taken this long to collate all the data from the radio telescopes around the world. Um, the sheer volume of size, I guess, means that they couldn't just dropbox it to each other, right? Hey? That's right. In fact, the easiest <laughs> way was to take it on airplanes and fly it around because it wouldn't. It would be too slow. I mean, it's five thousand hard drives essentially um, into one image, and you know, to take the image, they had to connect these eight radio telescopes, and they had to observe at the same time, like down to the nanosecond, and they had to make sure, you know, like if you press the start button one fraction of a thousand second late, the image was ruined. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's, that's amazing. No pressure. Yeah, no pressure <laughs> and weather and, you know, all those sorts of things. And, um, and then they had people check and recheck and then had new people check just to make sure that they checked right. An incredible story that did come out of, uh, of this was MIT's Katie Bowman, uh, who developed the algorithm to take the, all that data and make sense of it. Uh, how cool is it that, that this post, uh, she's a post grad and <laughs> she's contributed this, the biggest thing to science in uh, years. Yeah, you know, it's, and it's, it's a really a, a, a testament to that. It requires a huge amount of people of all different skill sets to do these things. And, you know, we often like think sometimes it's a, it's a scientist hanging out by themselves, but no, it's a whole bunch of people coming together to really work together to do these really amazing ideas uh, and, and coordinate it and work together and be a, an ultimate team player across multiple countries and continents. I, I, I'm, I'm just as impressed of how it was done and the fact that it was done. You know, I think that like if Einstein was here, he wouldn't be saying, you know, ha ha, I'm right again. I think he'd be saying, wow, like you actually made it, managed to do this. That's kind of crazy. <laughs> I was just doodling on a napkin, but I was right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like how do you get all of these people to coordinate and get it to work? Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's fairly mind boggling and impressive. And it's great to see that we can see the, the, sat, the shadow or the silhouette rather uh, of this black hole six and a half billion times the mass of our sun. I think the best thing about this is that there is hope for humanity. We can come together in in goals other than warfare and and such forth, and and we can actually break scientific uh, boundaries and and learn more about our universe. That's right. You know, we you give us a really hard task. We find a way to work together to do it. You know, it, it's really cool to see these things happen and see this image. And and now, like, no, yeah, yeah, an event horizon is a real thing. And hey 
all right, now we can start to probe gravity. We can even potentially measure and do funny things with time around these black holes. And, you know, they, they're already imaging more black holes. It's absolutely incredible. Now, the image that we saw uh, was from the supermassive black hole uh, of the M87 galaxy. We haven't seen Sagittarius A yet. Uh, our supermassive black hole yet have we no this was only of this distant one and, and uh, simply it actually was a bit easier because even though it's further away it was a lot lot bigger and there's actually a little bit of less stuff to do there's a there's a lot of things to look through in our milky way so if you look outside of it, it's a bit easier the sagittarius a star only weighs about four million times the mass of our sun only whereas this monster is six and a half billion times the mass of our sun it's incredible to think of those the the sheer scales of that as well i, I saw or a, a size comparison which put our entire solar system uh, in inside the black hole and there was still space around it. That's right. You know, uh, it, it's, it's huge and it's contained in this really massive area. And yet, you know, the area on the sky you're looking at is like a millionth of a millionth of a hundredth of the size of the full moon on the sky. Like that's what you're resolving, like this tiny, tiny speck that – normally you would never be able to see it's funny that um you know some of the comments online i saw about it it's just a fuzzy cgi image yeah you know and, it, and it's cool in some ways because like we've gotten so used to good animations that like no this is the real <laughs> thing and uh you know I, I think about like when we think about exoplanets again you know we're not even directly really able to see exoplanets planets around other stars that often we've only seen a few and just as bright dots you know it's a we get so used to maybe the pictures or the animations that the real stuff is really hard uh, and it's nice to see it and it's only going to get better they're going to build more telescopes more images more everything because of course once you do something really cool you have to do it a million times so one thing that we've been covering the last couple of weeks uh, with talking the, the new talk in science, you know, we've been delving on Mars and, and stuff like that. And I was just very curious, if we put a radio telescope or even a, a visual telescope out in Mars or on the moon, we're going to get even better imagery because we're not going through the atmosphere? In, in fact, when we talked about the Chinese landing on the far side of the moon, um, one of the experiments they had was a little small radio dish to test how radio quiet it is because the moon, the far side of the moon is the most radio quiet place in the universe that's because the rate most radio loud place in the universe that we kind of know of right now is earth God, we're noisy because of us that's right we're very noisy people <laughs> so if you go on the far side of the moon the, the other side of the moon blocks all of that and so they actually want to build a large radio telescope on the side of the moon uh because it would be beautifully in terms of crystal clear no noise no interference you know you know computers cars even phones microwaves all produce radio noise uh, there's none of that on the moon. Is it years to study this image now um, and then find some more? Oh, I think there'll be a lot of work that goes into it. I'm already expecting to see papers popping online of theorists taking another look at it, uh, trying different things. And uh, and then, yeah, it's going to be, you know, I imagine it's going to be a huge field now that they can do this and, and keep doing it. Uh, so yeah, it's definitely only the beginning. Now to put an Aussie flavour on this, uh, I did see you on Sunrise yesterday saying that uh, this black hole is far more exciting than the election and it's basically where we should all go <laughs> for the next five weeks. Exactly. No, I like it even on the day of the elections called uh, We Still All Care About a Big Black Hole 55 Million Light Years Away. That's a good thing in my book. <laughs> Fantastic, Brad. Thanks for talking science. Always. Don't forget, you can get early access to behind-the-scenes info and the latest podcasts by becoming a member right now over at patreon.com slash au. I'm also tweeting and posting Star Trek episodes every six hours throughout the week on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Find us over there, search for Trek Zone, uh, and let's have a conversation about your favourite or least favourite episodes. Uh, looking forward to it. This is TrekZone.org, Australia's first Star Trek fan site, going boldly since 2003.